In this lecture, um, I'm going to start Chapter 9 in Griffith's Electrodynamics Book uh, Edition 4. So, Chapter 9 is on electromagnetic waves. Um, and so, we're going to start off um, with the simple case of no free charges in the system, which may sound counterintuitive because you know, where do we get the fields? Well, the fields are, um, are come from the charges or the currents. I mean, that's what Maxwell's first and fourth equations say. Gauss's law says that um, charges produce fields. Or <clears throat> um, Maxwell's fourth equation says that currents create, create magnetic fields. Um, however, Maxwell's fourth equation also says that a changing electric field Will, change, will create a magnetic field. And Maxwell's third equation says a changing magnetic field will create an electric field. So we're going to consider the cases eventually of um, just modulating uh, electric and magnetic fields. Um, and we don't know where their source was. All we do know is that if we change the electric field, we'll create a magnetic field. If we change that magnetic field, we'll create an electric field. And eventually what we'll also show is that these modulating fields modulate like waves. So therefore we get electromagnetic waves. Um, but before we start any of that discussion, we're going to do a little bit of review on waves. Um, and just to bring just a refresher, I know, you know, you've already taken a course which involved uh, waves. And so um, that knowledge uh, is still with you. But what I want to do is to just kind of a, a refresher. So section 9-1 is one-dimensional waves. Um, and actually section, subsection 9-1.1 is on um, getting a wave equation. Um, how do we come up with a wave equation? So, um, you know, we could start really far back and say, what is a wave? And you could come up with some definition, like it's a disturbance of a continuous medium with properties of a fixed shape and constant velocity. So that seems to cover all our bases. Um, but essentially, that's what we're going to focus on is the fact that it is a disturbance of a continuous medium. So that is a key feature of waves is that it is a continuous structure unlike a particle, where a particle is localized in one spot right here, uh, the wave is a continuous um, di a disturbance um, in that medium. Um, it's actually a little bit easier if we start thinking not as a sinusoidal continuous wave, but as a wave pulse. So if we just look at one pulse here of the wave, then um, that pulse is going to move with a velocity and it's going to move down to this position. So I'm looking at the position z and I'm looking at the uh, some function which describes um, the shape of that wave pulse. So this wave pulse is moved from an initial position here to a final position here. If we consider this a time dependent problem then this length is just the speed of the wave times the time it takes to get from one place to the next. So I could label these functions now as it's a position dependent function. This is a time equals t equals zero. And this is my function um, of the wave shape um, depending on the position z at some later time t. So it would be really good is if we could come up with an equation that would relate the function at a time to the function when time t equals zero. So mathematically, what am I saying? I want to say that this um, function, um, uh, which, this function f, which describes the shape of the wave, which is dependent on position and time, I could rewrite as. Um, the initial position um, uh, 
at a time t0. So I so in order to get from uh, here and work my way back to here, I have essentially said that I'm just going to take this function and I'm substituting z for this initial position z minus vt. That gets me back to the initial spot. I could rewrite this actually not as a two-dimensional function, but as a one-dimensional function by saying the function is now g z minus vt. Because if t is equal to zero, I'm at the position z. If t is not equal to zero, then I'm at some other position. Um, so let's make a substitution. Say u is equal to z minus vt. And if I take the derivative of f with respect to z, then I would get um, the uh, function g, the derivative of g with respect to u, and the derivative of u with respect to z. So just the chain rule, essentially. So, or, or another way of saying it is that the derivative of f with respect to z is the derivative of g with respect to u. Okay, um, now let's consider time. The derivative of f with respect to time is equal to dg du du dt, which is now equal to d um, g du, like so, except for the fact that du dt is equal to minus v. So I have to put a minus v in here, like that. <clears throat> um, okay, so now if I take the second derivative, the second derivative of f with respect to z is now taking the derivative dz of dg du, which is like taking the second derivative of g with respect to u, du dz, which again du dz is just one. So the second derivative um, of f with respect to z is the same as the second derivative of g with respect to u. Okay, now let's do that with time. Second derivative of f with respect to time is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to time dg du minus v. Um, the minus v is a constant, so I can pull it out front. And I would then get the second derivative of g with respect to u. And the chain rule gives me a du dt, which again we said was um, minus v. So that means I get a minus v quantity squared, the derivative of g with respect to u. Or, in the end, I would get v squared, second derivative of g with respect to u, um, like so. So, um, if I take a look at this, uh, <clears throat> um, oh, I essentially, so if I look at this, I can, uh, I have a second derivative of g with respect to u, so that means that the second derivative of g with respect to u is the same thing as saying the second derivative of f with respect to z, um, or 1 over v squared, the second derivative of f with respect to t. And that is my wave equation. So that right there specifies, I can write it this way, that a function that's, that defines a wave has to satisfy this second order differential equation. That um, when you take the second derivative of the function with respect to the space variable, and then that should be equal to the second derivative with respect to the time variable. 
with the factor of the 1 over v squared um, that you would have. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, with the what we could do is we could take a look at this and, and put this into more physical um, context and say, what if we had a classical string? And this string has now been wiggled to make it look like a wave. <clears throat> and that's because we have a tension in the string on both sides, like so. And what we can look at is the components of that tension, like this. So this is at some angle theta prime. This is at some angle theta. And um, <clears throat> the uh, if we look at the, that tension in the string, the change in the force in um, the uh, y direction and the vertical direction would be t sine theta prime minus t sine theta. Um, or if we look at a small angle approximation, that means the sine of theta is approximately to the tangent of theta, and the tangent of theta is basically the slope. So the change in the function over z, like this. So I could put that in and say that the change in the vertical force um, is the tension df dz at z plus delta z minus the slope of z at just z, <clears throat> which I can rewrite as the tension um, df dz second derivative times delta z. <clears throat> um, okay, so now the mass per unit length, mu, so if we take a mass per unit length of the string, so we basically kind of look at the string's linear density, um, and then we apply a Newton's second law, so delta f is going to be equal to the mass times the length, so that's the total mass, times the um, uh, acceleration is basically how the function changes. Um, so basically this is the, uh, the, well, it's the change of the slope. The acceleration is just the change in the rate. So that's where I get, so little f is the shape of the wave, big F is the, um, is the force. And so if I look at that, I now have um, what I had before. Um, oh, this right here is the, oh, I'm sorry, go back. The acceleration is the change in my shape with respect to time. Okay, so now if I put this back, if I equate delta f, then what I would get is um, tension, change in the function with basically the slope with respect to position, delta z is equal to mu delta z, the change in my function with respect to time, the second derivative. So delta z's cancel, and what I'm left with is my wave equation, which essentially says that the 1 over the velocity is equal to mu over t, or the velocity is the square root of the tension in the string divided by the linear mass density. And that's what we're going to find for all waves is that the velocity is dependent on some characteristic of the problem. And when we get to electromagnetic fields, we'll find out what those conditions are. <clears throat>